Good morning and welcome to Faith Reformed Church. If you have any announcements, you can come make your way forward. For Youth Discipleship, we have a typical week uh, with core small groups tonight and then Connect and Quest on Wednesday. One thing I want to remind the juniors and seniors of this morning is that today during the Sunday School Hour, Zach will help prepare you for Youth Sunday. So it's good for everyone to attend even if you're not going to be there because it's an opportunity to learn about what the worship service, what all the things that we do in a worship service are all about. But if you have a speaking part, that's particularly important that you're there this morning. So just as a reminder, that's what Zach will be leading you through this morning. And then we had a couple fundraisers for the Baltimore trip coming up that I'd like to keep on your radar. First, if you'd like to purchase mulch by the bag, those orders are due this Thursday. So there are forms by the mailboxes, and there's also a link in the bulletin. And we will deliver it this Saturday, April 20th, between 9 and 3. And we're even willing to spread it for a donation. So just as a reminder, the mulch orders are due on Thursday. The other thing is that the brat fry that we hold on the day of the community garage sale, that will be on May 4th. So if you'd like to help donate ingredients, you can pick up a mail uh, envelope back by the mailbox and turn those into the offering by May 5th. Or if you'd like to donate a pan of bars, you can sign up to do that by the mailboxes as well. The proceeds for this, these fundraisers go towards the Baltimore trip, and I always like to thank the congregation for your continued support of the youth. Well, Secret Church is coming up this week, Friday, April 19th at 6 p.m. There's a sign-up sheet in the back, but we're going to show a video first, and then I'll explain some of the premise behind it. All right, so that's David Platt. He's a little bit stretched out. He doesn't exactly look like that. Uh, he's a, a pastor, really gifted teacher, uh, really big heart for missions. And so the premise behind uh, Secret Church was to raise awareness for the persecuted church. So as we gather for worship freely this morning, there are tens or maybe even hundreds of millions of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who need to worship in secret, who worship literally underground in certain cases because it's illegal to worship in their country or because their life is being threatened even by them being Christians. And so the premise behind Secret Church was to have an extended period of teaching time because oftentimes people in the underground church will need to spend hours and hours and hours together because they don't get to meet every week or because they're so hungry for the word of God that they want to sit under solid teaching for five or six hours in a row. And so David Platt's going to be going verse by verse through Ruth. It's really powerful stuff. But then along the way, we'll be stopping to pray, specifically this year for North Korea. Uh, North Korea may be the place in the world where Christians have it the hardest. As they're constantly under surveillance, they're being gathered into concentration camps, systematically killed. This is an opportunity for us to come together a, to receive great teaching, and B, to pray for and support the persecuted church. So if you're interested in that, there's a sign-up sheet in back, Friday, April 19th at 6 p.m. If you have any questions, come and talk to myself, my wife, Colette, Tanya Arnson, Jamie Minan, Dan Weiss, anyone on the mission team. Thank you. Thanks, BJ. Along those lines uh, as well, in thinking about uh, the cause of missions, the missionary organization of the PCA is called the Mission to the World. Um, and it is uh, committed to sending missionaries out into the world so that Christ would be made known. But we also do have, every year, this Compassion Fund offering that we talked about last week. Uh, the information is in your bulletin, to, uh, and we're going to be taking that in our offering bags today, later on in the service. And so uh, the idea behind the Compassion Fund every year is as money is given to our missions organization in the denomination that have certain means to provide for people around the world, uh, Christians around the world, churches around the world, or just those who are suffering in the world, around the world, 
they are able to distribute those funds where there is deep need because of things like natural disasters and other issues. And so there's information in your bulletin, there's information in the insert last week, and if you are going to be giving to that cause today, later on when we take our offering, you can designate that on the envelope, just put MTW and the deacons will know what that's for. Uh, as, uh, also, if you weren't able to attend our congregational meeting last week, just a quick update on that. Uh, we did let the congregation know that we are seriously considering calling Lincoln Russ as a pastoral apprentice uh, to be, Lord willing, ordained as an assistant pastor next year. And that's something that we're still praying about, that we're moving toward. Um, and we are going to be interviewing him. The elders are going to be interviewing him on Tuesday um, through Zoom as well at our session meeting. And so we do ask for continued prayer along those lines. Uh, the idea is to continue to pursue him and seek an opportunity for him to come on staff later this year and to be on staff really for the next three or four years as we support him uh, moving toward licensure and ordination in the PCA and ministering in Wisconsin, and then also at the same time pray about church planting in the next three or four years. And so we'll be talking more about that, but that was uh, just some of what we shared last week if you weren't able to be there at a congregational meeting. And so continue to pray with us along those lines. We're seeking the Lord's face, asking for wisdom, and saying throughout the whole time, if this is foolish, if this is not for your glory, for the good of your church, close doors. But if this is, may we be courageous, may we be bold, and may we continue to seek your face and move forward in faithfulness. And so pray with us uh, as we meet on Tuesday and interview him. With that said, we are here today to worship God in and through Jesus Christ. Uh, we at the same time have the opportunity and the gift of partaking in the sacrament of communion. And so we have the privilege of both worshiping and hearing God's word, responding to him and enjoying his presence at the table as well. And so let us first stand and greet one another and remain standing for the call to worship. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud, loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord.
bow our heads and worship before the Lord. <coughs> Heavenly Father, you are God, sovereign God. Lord, there are many things that we could be frightened of, uh, many things that are uh, worthy of grief and unbelief in this world. Father, there are wars and rumors of wars. There is political turmoil. There's sin and strife in our own country. We see it all around us. Lord, there is sin in our own lives. And yet your king is on the throne and he has already won. And by his blood, we are free and ransomed and justified. And so we bow and worship before you. So thankful that we can come and worship you. We ask, Father, that our hearts would be set right within us, that you'd help us to be obedient, and that you give us the courage to go out and to make your name known in the world, despite all the world's hate and unbelief. We ask all this in Jesus' name and by the Spirit. Amen. As it's Communion Sunday, we move right into our corporate confession of sin. And so we are going to do that now, recognizing that we do have a king who is on the throne, and he rules and reigns over everything. And in his presence, he does invite us to come, but we come as a confessing people. We come recognizing our sin. And as we recognize our sin, we are renewed in the grace and mercy of our Savior. So let us first confess our sin together, corporately, and then take a moment of private confession. First, together. O oh Lord, you are the immortal, invisible, only wise God, and nothing is hidden from your sight. Even when sin is not visible to others, you see it all. You know when we are cold and distant and separate ourselves from you. You see when we worry and fret and fail to trust you as king. You see how quickly we judge by appearances, though you are concerned for our hearts. Please forgive us for sins seen and unseen, and draw us closer to Christ by your Spirit. Now take a moment of private confession. Amen. Now hear these words of assurance from Colossians 1. Be strengthened, brothers and sisters, with God's power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the fathers, uh, to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Friends, believe the good news. We have a Savior and King who loved us and gave himself up for us. Let us continue to sing in light of the Lamb that was slain.
I didn't have us sit either for the confession of sin, but that's okay. It's good for us to stand and confess our sin at times as well. I also realized I forgot during our time of announcements to mention that our men's breakfast is next Sunday at 7 before the service, uh, and there is a sign up out in the narthex for that, and do encourage you to come if you are able to come. Uh, and now we have the privilege of turning to God's Word. We'll be in 1 Samuel 16 today, 1 Samuel 16, and we've seen in 1 Samuel over the past several weeks, the beginning of Saul's downfall. Uh, last week, he was decisively rejected as king by the Lord for his unbelief and for his disobedience. And this brought grief. Uh, grief to the Lord and grief to Samuel as Saul's reign gets darker and darker. And although our context is different, we may at times feel ourselves in the same situation or find ourselves in the same situation. Uh, like Samuel, we may experience grief, a uh, grief as we see wicked and sinful leaders, a uh, grief over the mess that comes from them, a uh, grief also over the sin perhaps of family members and friends that bring chaos wherever they go, or perhaps we may even grieve over our own sin and the impact that it has. And when this happens, what do we do? Sometimes we can be paralyzed by grief and lose all hope. At other times, we're tempted to put our hope in what we see. A new leader. A new plan. But as we'll see today, the only solid ground when everything caves isn't found in human planning, isn't found in our wisdom, 
But ultimately, in the all-wise God who raises up a king himself after his own heart. And this is what we're going to see today as we turn to 1 Samuel 16. So let us turn there together. 1 Samuel 16. If you're in your pew Bible, this is page 282. And let us hear the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. But behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him. For we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul... And a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey, laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat, and sent them by David his son to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor-bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, as we come to your word, we do ask that you'd help us to behold marvelous things that you have inspired and have given for us to see and receive and to change us. Open the eyes of our heart by your spirit and help us to receive and follow your king. For we pray in his name. Amen. 
But throughout Samuel, we have seen the sin of Israel in asking for a king like the nations. And we have also seen the sin of Saul in turning from God's word and rejecting the Lord. And yet, in the midst of the darkness of sin and rebellion, we now see the dawn of new hope as God graciously provides his own king for his people. And he will not be a king like the nations, but he'll be a king after God's own heart. And that's really who David will be, a king that God chose to know him and be like him and to shepherd his people as he intended. And as such, David also points us to the ultimate king, to the Lord Jesus Christ, the man with God's own heart. And so this is a good news that we need to see in our passage, that God does provide for himself a king to lead his people, to shepherd his people, and be all that we need. But as we're going to see today, we only know the blessing of God's king if we don't remain blinded in unbelief and human wisdom like Israel and Saul, but instead we see God's sovereign purpose and submit to his perfect wisdom and serve in Christ's gracious spirit. And so this is what we're going to see today, to receive and to know the blessing of the man after God's own heart, God's king that he enthrones. We need to see his sovereign purpose, submit to his perfect wisdom, and serve in Christ's gracious spirit. And so first, we need to see God's sovereign purpose. And as chapter 15 ended with Samuel grieving Saul's hardness of heart and the consequences of his unbelief and disobedience, we saw the reality of the darkness that came for both Saul and all Israel. And now as chapter 16 begins, we see that the grief continues on. Samuel evidently is still grieving because the Lord says to him, how long will you grieve over Saul? Samuel's having a hard time getting over his grief getting over the grief of Saul's sin, over the grief of the impact of his sin upon the nation and all that it means for God's kingdom. And I think we can understand that. I think sometimes when our lives fall apart around us, or the sin of loved ones or leaders causes damage, that we can be stuck in grief. It can be hard to get over it. And that's what's going on with Samuel. But notice what God goes on to say to him. How long... Will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Now, God here isn't saying that it's bad that Samuel is grieving over Saul. But it's possible to be so stuck in grieving our situations that we act as though God is not in control. And that's really what's going on here. The grief has moved beyond grief to unbelief. And that can happen. In fact, there was actually a time in the 1500s when Martin Luther was so discouraged in ministry that he couldn't get out of bed for days. And so one day his wife put on all black, which was a sign of grieving someone's death. And when Martin Luther asked her what was going on and why she was wearing black, she said that by how you're acting, it looks like God is dead. And so I'm grieving a loss. And that's kind of Samuel here. And it's where we can be too. We can be so stuck in lament over the sin and wickedness that we see impacting our country or our family or even in the church, that we move from grief to unbelief, as though God is not on his throne, as though he is not in control, and so all is not hopeless. And God doesn't want us to stay there, paralyzed by grief and unable to move forward. And so here he calls Samuel not to keep grieving, but to see how he's in control, how he is the one who actually rejected Saul as king. And even more, that he's the one who's raising up a new king, his own king. He says to Samuel, fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And notice that language. Yes, the people made a foolish choice in Saul. And Saul has been a sinful mess and is getting worse and affecting everyone. But God says, I have rejected him and I have provided for myself a king. And that gives hope in the midst of the mess. 
Because this means that the Lord is not only in control of all the different movements of history around us and all the chaos that comes from the sin of others, but he is also at work in the mess to raise up his own king and accomplish all of his gracious purposes for his people. And we see this even more today when we consider the whole picture of Scripture. Because notice where Samuel here is called to go. He's called to arise and go to Bethlehem. And Bethlehem was just a small village in Judah that wasn't very significant. Except in the book of Ruth, right before 1 Samuel, there's a man named Boaz. And he's from Bethlehem. And in that book, we see how God weaved together the lives of all these people to not only provide for them and produce an heir and care for their family, but in that story of God's providence, he was also bringing about the birth of David, who's Boaz, his great-grandson. And so decades before God called Samuel to go to Bethlehem, God was already at work there to raise up David as the king after his own heart that he would give to his people. And even centuries before that, God had already promised that a king would come from the line of Judah in Genesis 49, a king that would rule over the nations. And it's interesting, that couldn't have been Saul, because Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. But now, in David, God was raising up a king in the tribe of Judah, in the city of Bethlehem. And in so doing was also preparing for the coming of Christ. The ultimate king from the tribe of Judah, the line of David, born in Bethlehem, to reign over all nations. And so while it may seem at times like we are just pawns on the chessboard of nations and leaders and the decisions of men, in reality, all the leaders and all the movements of history are in God's hands as he moves the chessboard to provide his own king to shepherd and save his own people. He knows exactly what he is doing. And that gives us hope. It enables us to move forward in faith, even when we are paralyzed at times by grief over sin and misery. And also, if we're paralyzed by fear. Notice that this is also what we see with Samuel. Because God called him to go and anoint a son of Jesse, but in verse 2, we see that he's resistant. He asks, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And this gives a depiction, on the one hand, of where Saul is already at. Samuel knows that he won't like hearing about a new king being anointed, and he will try to kill Samuel, and so he's afraid. And yet notice again what God now says to Samuel. He says, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Now, at this point, some people get concerned that God is telling Samuel to lie here, but it's important to see that God's not telling Samuel to lie or even to deceive Saul. He simply tells him that he should have a sacrificial feast and invite Jesse and his sons, but you don't need to broadcast that you're anointing one of them as king. But more important... And easy to miss is what God says at the end. He says, and I will show you what to do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. God is calling Samuel to follow his word even in the midst of his grief and fear. Because he's in control. And he will guide and direct Samuel and accomplish his plan and raise up his king. He's got this. And Samuel just needs to see it. And then we're told in verse 4 that Samuel did what the Lord commanded. No longer paralyzed by grief or fear, but now moving forward in faith, trusting God's sovereign purpose. Because now, by God's word, he has a renewed understanding that God is in control and he's raising up a king for himself. He sees God's sovereign purpose and it allows him to move forward. And it's what we often need to see as well. Dale Ralph Davis writes that there is something encouraging in the Lord's instructions here. 
that the Lord is able to provide a new beginning. He will provide for his people when all is coming undone. The true king never loses control of his kingdom. He is never nonplussed by the latest emergency in his realm. And that's what we have to see too. He's not taken by surprise by anything that we encounter, by anything in our lives, by even Iran sending drones to Jerusalem. None of these things shock him. But he is on his throne, ruling and reigning over all the course of history, and he sets his king on his throne. And we only need to see his sovereign purpose to give him such a king, to give us such a king. And we'll be able to follow faithfully. And this also leads to the next thing that we need to see as well. To enjoy the blessing of God's king, we must see God's sovereign purpose, but we must also submit to God's perfect wisdom. In verse 4 and 5, Samuel goes on to Bethlehem, and the elders of the city come out trembling, probably because they don't know why a prophet is coming, and they might also be afraid of Saul as well. There's probably at this point a growing divide between Samuel and Saul, and that concerns them. Now Samuel's coming to them. What's going to happen? But Samuel says that he comes peaceably to sacrifice to the Lord, and then he consecrates the elders, he consecrates Jesse and his sons, and he invites them to this sacrificial feast of the Lord, where he'll anoint one of Jesse's sons as king. And as they come in, Samuel's looking at these sons. And the first one that he sees is Eliab. And as he sees his stature, he thinks, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Until God corrects him in verse 7, saying, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. And it's fascinating that at this point, Samuel is now actually thinking like Israel did before, if you remember. Eliab looks like a king in his height and appearance. He seems to be a great warrior. And so Samuel thinks, this must be the king. But that's ultimately worldly wisdom, and that's how he's operating. He's judging someone's quality by what he thinks he sees on the outside. And one of the things that we need to see is that if Samuel can fall into this, we certainly can fall into it too. On the one hand, we can think of ourselves based on what is on the outside. How smart we are, how athletic we are, how much money we make, what job we have. And sometimes we can boast because of what we have on the outside, or we can lament and wish that we had something more on the outside. I actually remember a time in seventh grade when I would, was crying at night because of how short I was, and I was asking God to just make me taller. We can be so concerned at times about those things, about what's on the outside, and that can even lead us to judge others by what we see on the outside. We can want pastors with charisma who can attract a crowd. We can want political leaders who get things done and speak with power. We can want to be around people that seem important or successful or cool. And we can distance ourselves from others who aren't that way. We so quickly make judgments based upon what we see on the outside. But God tells Samuel, don't do that. And he tells him why in verse 7. At the end of verse 7, he says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. We can be so concerned about ourselves and about what's on the outside and about what we see of other people on the outside, but God isn't. He's just not. We can be attracted to power and significance and looks and money and success. And God doesn't care about any of it. Rather, he cares about our hearts. About whether our hearts are devoted to him and submissive to him. And so he's more concerned about our prayer life and our portfolio. He's more concerned about our care for others and our success at sports. He's more concerned about whether we love him and follow him than any human accomplishment or attribute that we care so much about. And so our calling is to submit to his wisdom, 
to align ourselves with his concerns, to be shaped by them, and to especially be shaped by them in the king that we want. We see this especially in God's choice of a king in verse 8 to 13. Because in verse 8, Jesse then has his sons pass before Samuel. First Abinadab, and then Shema, and then all of his other sons. And we're told that the Lord didn't choose any of them. And so in verse 11, Samuel asks, are all your sons here? And Jesse says, there remains yet the youngest. But behold, he's keeping the sheep. And there is a certain tone to that statement. Yeah, there is one more, but he's the youngest. And that word could also be translated the smallest, the least. He's the most insignificant from a human perspective, especially in that day as age made all the importance in the world. You didn't care about the youngest. And so David was not anyone's choice for a king. David was not Samuel's choice who is perhaps the most sanctified person in Israel. David was not even his own dad's choice. But David was God's choice. And so Samuel told Jesse to go get him, and he did. And we're told what he looked like, that he was ruddy, which may be reddish complexion or a healthy complexion, that he had beautiful eyes, and that he was handsome. And the Lord told Samuel, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And that's interesting at first glance. David wasn't tall and striking in appearance, but we are told that he was attractive in appearance. And we may wonder, what's up with that? We just heard that God doesn't choose on the basis of appearance, and now we hear that David was handsome. But here's the thing, that's not why God chose him. It's not that God is angry with people who are tall, attractive, and athletic. He just isn't concerned about it. And so God didn't choose David because he was handsome or because he wasn't handsome. Any more than he rejected Saul because he was tall. No, God rejected Saul because he didn't care about God's word. Because he didn't repent. Because he had a hard heart. Didn't have a humble, submissive, soft heart. But now God is choosing a a king who will be submissive to his word. A king who we'll see later on who will repent when confronted. A king ultimately who will prove to be a man of character. Whose concerns are aligned with God's concerns. In fact, we already see a glimpse of this here. The first time we see Saul, if you remember, he was tall like a warrior king and looked the part of a king. And Israel was pretty excited about that. But in terms of his own character, he was hiding, he was terrified, and he couldn't even find his dad's donkeys. But the first time we see David, he's small and young and rejected by his dad, but he didn't even leave his sheep for this meal. You notice that? He's still there with his sheep caring for them. And in the next story, we see how he was content and faithful And a man of valor. And this is the man who God chooses to lead his people. Because while he didn't look the part on the outside, and was young, and was the last in line in his home, and was dismissed by his dad and his brothers, as we'll see next week, he was a faithful shepherd. And he would be a humble leader who would care for God's sheep and sacrifice for them and lead them in his will and his ways. And that should be what we want in a king. Because David here is really a picture of the ultimate king, Jesus Christ, who was also rejected by his family, who had nothing about him on the outside that was super impressive. In fact, people in his own hometown said, look, he's just one of us. People from outside his hometown said, look, he's from there. Others saw him suffer, and they mocked him and said, this is not a king. But God said, this is my son, with whom whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. 
God's wisdom simply doesn't fit the mold of human wisdom. We look on the outside, we judge based upon what we see. But God doesn't care. And so he raises up a king in his own wisdom that nobody else was looking for. And praise God that he does that. Because imagine what would happen if God followed Samuel's wisdom and anointed Eliab. It would have been Saul 2.0. And imagine also if God followed the Jews' wisdom or even the disciples' wisdom in the first century and gave them the king that they wanted, a ruler to defeat Rome, to turn Israel into a great nation. And imagine if God gave us a king that we often want to give us good health, an easier life, more money, to give us our best life now. But praise God that he doesn't do that. In his wisdom, he doesn't give us the king that we so often want and are looking for. He gives us the king that we need. He raises up his own king. He gives us a savior that everybody rejected but who would willingly lay down his life for us. A shepherd who would care for us, who would pray for us, who leads us safely home through many dangers, toils, and snares, and who is even now directing all of history toward all our good and his glory. And so our calling is to submit to God's wisdom, to align our concerns with God's concerns, not caring so much about outer appearance, but about the heart, and not wanting a king that gives us what we think we need now, but looking to Christ, the king who gives us what we need when we don't even see it, who saves us, who's with us, who's working in us, and who will keep us till the end. And so to know the blessings of the king that God provides for us, we need to see his sovereign purpose and submit to his perfect wisdom. And last, we must also serve in Christ's gracious spirit. At the end of verse 13, we're told what happened as David was anointed, that the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him from that day forward. Which doesn't mean, by the way, that this is when David was saved. This is not the spirit coming upon David at salvation but empowering him to serve as a king. This is something that often takes place in the Old Testament when prophets and priests and kings were anointed were sometimes told how the Spirit would come upon them and empower them for service and for their ministry that God called them to, to their office. And we saw the same thing earlier actually with Saul himself. And that's also the sense here that the Spirit came upon David so that he would be the king after God's own heart. And that's why it's also so powerful to read verse 14. That as the Spirit came upon David, we're also told that the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. There is this striking contrast between the two. David's filled with the Spirit as the Spirit departs from Saul. And on top of that, we're told that a harmful spirit from the Lord is now tormenting him. And this could be perhaps a demonic spirit that God allowed to afflict him. Not demon possession, but affliction. Or it could be an angelic being that God sent to afflict David or Saul. Or this could mean just a spirit of darkness and fear and anxiety that God allowed to come over Saul. I think it's probably a demonic spirit, but it could be any of those. The point is that Saul is in rebellion against the Lord. And so the Lord removed the power and presence of his spirit and is allowing Saul to feel the consequences of life apart from him. And so he's under the power and darkness of the evil one and even his own evil mind. He's experienced here even even a little taste of hell that's described in the New Testament as the gloom of outer darkness. This is what he's experienced a little foretaste of the darkness that comes apart from God. And as they consider what to do, Saul's servants give the suggestion to find a man skillful in playing the lyre, which was kind of like a harp, 
so that when the har harmful spirit would come upon Saul, he would be able to play music and bring relief. And as they consider who, they recommend David. And notice how David's described. That he's the son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence. And the Lord is with him. And this goes to show, on the one hand, that David probably isn't super young here. He's probably a late teenager, which is why he's described as a man of war. But even more, it's clear that there's something different about David, and that's what they recognize. It's encapsulated well in that very last phrase, that it was clear that the Lord was with him. And so Saul sends for David in verse 19, and David entered into his service in verse 21. And at this point, we're told that Saul loved David, that David became his armor bearer. And by the end, we're told that whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David played the lyre, and Saul was refreshed and made well, and the harmful spirit departed from, here, from him. And in many ways, this really is a fascinating scene. It says something on the one hand about the gift, the God-given gift of music. We talked about that last week at our family worship gathering and the value of music. It also at the same time shows the blessing of God's Spirit upon us so that when God is with us by the Spirit, there is this contentment because He is with us in contrast to Saul who is in the misery of living in isolation from God apart from Him. And this also along those lines shows this contrast between Saul and David and why David is the king that God's people need. Saul is a king like the nations. And now he is weak and terrified, worldly, and a harm to himself in the absence of the Spirit. But David is a king after God's own heart and chosen by God. And he's strong, content, godly, and a blessing to others in the power of the Spirit. But as one writer says, this also shows us something else. That this also shows us the pattern for our service. Because here, David is a servant of the Lord who is serving and blessing a man who is under God's judgment and who loves David now, but is actually going to soon hate him in a few chapters. And in Christ, we are also servants of the Lord who are called to serve and bless those under God's judgment who may at times appreciate that, but at times they may hate us as well. And for us to know and live out the blessing of the king after God's own heart, we must serve and live in this world in the same spirit that rushed upon David when he was anointed as king and remained upon Jesus when he was anointed as king. In fact, this is actually what it means when we talk about Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ. That the word Christ actually means anointed one. And he was not only anointed as the king of Israel for a time, like David, but Christ came to be anointed as our king forever in the power of the Spirit. And after dying and rising from the dead, think about what he did. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. And he poured out his spirit upon the church. And so as the Heidelberg Catechism puts it, we now share in Christ's anointing. That's why we're called Christians. He has given us his spirit so that the Lord would be with us and strengthen and empower us for service just as we see with David. And so we have spiritual gifts to serve the body of Christ and are empowered by the Spirit to be salt and light in a world under judgment. David is a blessing to Saul, even as he is under darkness and judgment. And he serves him like Christ in the power of the Spirit. And in Christ, we are also in a world under darkness and judgment, but we have the opportunity to bless others as we follow Christ in the power of the Spirit. It's a calling to comfort people in affliction, to be light to those enslaved by the darkness, to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us, to bless those around us just like our Savior. 
And that may look like a number of things. It may look like getting involved in foster care. It may look like volunteering at Anchor of Hope. Or it may just look like getting to know your neighbors. Praying for unbelievers around you. Seeking to genuinely do good to people in darkness. And sometimes that will be appreciated. And may give opportunities for us to tell them the gospel, to tell them about Christ, to tell them about the Savior who has forgiven us our sins and changed us. But at other times, that will be hated, as we'll see later on with Saul. But every time it's an opportunity to be like Christ. We're actually going to see this a lot in the weeks ahead as David embodied Christ a thousand years before he came. There's these two things going on with David that we have to understand as we go through Samuel. That David, on the one hand, on the one hand embodied the perfect king. That he shows in advance what Christ would be like. He is, as we say, a type of Christ. The leader who saves God's people, who fights for God's people, and cares for God's people. And at the same time, David is also a picture for what it looks like to follow Christ, to follow him in faith, to be like Christ. And as we know Jesus and have received the same spirit that rushed upon David, we are called to know Christ and follow in his steps in a dark and broken world. And so while we know that the world is dark and sin and everywhere, we also see in Christ this hope and this calling. We see his sovereign purpose in Christ, to have a king after his own heart. And we're called to submit to his perfect wisdom, not judging by appearances, but remembering that God cares about the heart and has raised up a king after his own heart. And as we see him and know him, we're called to live and move by the Spirit and serve just like our Savior. Let's pray. Gracious Father, as we come to you, we do recognize our tendency to see things as the world sees things, to judge with human wisdom. We do recognize our tendency to grieve and be fearful at all the things that come up against us in this world. And we can be paralyzed. But Father, we do ask you that you would lift our eyes to see Jesus Christ to see your wisdom in giving us a Savior that we don't deserve, but we desperately need. And as we look to him, we pray that you would give us hope and help us also to follow in his steps in a world that is dark and opposed to you. Help us to know the good news of a Savior who loved us and gave himself up for us. And even as we come to the communion table, would you strengthen us by your Spirit that we would follow in his steps. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in his life, Jesus said that he came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so he loved his disciples, even when they left him. And he even loved those who didn't believe in him. He had compassion on them, like sheep without a shepherd. He even washed Judas' feet. He even prayed on the way to the cross for their very ones killing him, saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And as he died on the cross, he even gave up his life for enemies of God like us. As Paul said, it was while we were still sinners, while we were yet enemies, that Christ died for us. Christ is the king who loved us when we didn't love him. And it's here at the table that he wants us to see and know and digest his love, his promises, his goodness toward us. Around this table, as we see these elements, Christ intends to remind us of his love, but also to communicate it to us in the power of the Spirit, so that as we tangibly eat and drink together, he wants our faith to be nourished in him. He wants us to know that he's even with us now by the Spirit to strengthen, to encourage us, to know that he is our king, ruling and reigning right now and with us, and will one day come back for us. 
And until that day, we need this food for the dirt journey. We need strength to keep our eyes upon Christ so that we would know him and receive his grace day by day and follow in his steps. So we read in 1 Corinthians 11 that on the night when Christ was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we come to the table, we always say that this is not faith reform's table, that this is not a PCA table, it's our denomination. Rather, we say this is the Lord's table. And as such, it's open to all who know him, who have embraced him, For all who genuinely have turned from sin and trust in Christ alone for salvation and are members at a gospel preaching church. It's not for people who think they can earn God's grace, but it's for sinners who recognize that we can't, but who have thrown ourselves upon Jesus as our Savior and our King. And we're now in union with Him and His people, and He wants us together to come. And so we would say that if this is not you, if you are not sure that you know Christ and that you are in right relationship with his people, we would ask that you would let the elements pass. But if this is you this morning, even if you see and feel and sense the weight of your own sin, it is important to know that this is for you. Christ wants you to know his grace and his love. So if you're turning from sin and you're in right relationship with his people, we invite you to come to eat and drink in the presence of Christ. I'm now going to invite the elders forward as we pray over these elements that the Lord would set them apart for this purpose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for sending your Son to us. We thank you for giving us a King who is sovereign and all-powerful, and who rules and reigns even now in the heavenly places, and yet says to us, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Help us, Father, to come. Help us to come in humility. Help us to come in true and genuine repentance. And help us to see and to know and to digest the promises that we have in Jesus Christ of a king and a Savior who loved us and gave himself up for us, and is even with us now. For it's in him we pray. Amen. On the night when Christ was betrayed, he first took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the body of Christ given for you. Let us eat together in remembrance of our Savior. In the same way also the Lord Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, poured out for the sins of many. Drink in remembrance of me.
he shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, this is the cup of the new covenant in the blood of Christ. Let us drink together in remembrance of our Savior. Amen. Father, we thank you again for your grace and mercy to us in your Son. We pray that you would continue to fix our eyes upon him, to know that he is the one that fulfills all of your purposes, and to know that you have given him to us as our King and our Savior. We can rest upon him and rest in your wisdom and live under the blessing and power of your Spirit. Strengthen us to that end. Be with us in Christ. And may you be praised. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let us now pray over our offerings and respond in song. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that you have come and given us a wonderful sun and uh, for the spring. Father, we also pray that uh, as you bless us with the sun, that you bless us with these offerings. And uh, we pray that you can uh, give us cheerful hearts to give back to you. Uh, Father, we pray these things in your name. Amen. this. Why is Jesus called Christ, meaning anointed, together? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who fully reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our deliverance. Our only high priest, who has delivered us by the one sacrifice of his body, and who continually pleads our cause with the Father, and our eternal King, who governs us by His Word and Spirit, and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom He has won for us. Amen. You may be seated as we go to God now together in prayer. Father, we thank You for sending forth Your Son to be the Christ, the Anointed One, the one who came, born, and conceived in the power of the Spirit, the one who lived in the power of the Spirit, the one 
upon whom your spirit rested upon him and remains upon him even now, as he died and rose again and is at your right hand and now has poured out upon us your very spirit that we would know him and embrace him and live for him. And Father, we do pray that you would, by your spirit, help us to see and know Christ and to live for him. We pray that you would help us to know all that we have as a king in the midst of a dark and difficult world. Father, we do pray for our world in light of increasing tensions with Iran and Israel. We do pray that you would give wisdom and clarity and peace to the situation. Lord, we also pray for Jackson Dreider, uh, who is in the Middle East, and for those in the military in general. Uh, Lord, we do pray for them that you would give them the comfort and peace of knowing that we have a king who rules and reigns over all these things. And he will bring all of his enemies under his feet and will reign forever. And Father, we do pray that you would keep our eyes upon him as we go through big things like this or things in our own personal life that are equally as big. Give us strength to know that you are our God and Savior and King. That you are the God who is bringing all these things to their appointed end so that you be glorified and for our good. And we pray that you give us contentment and peace in the midst of the difficulty as we keep our eyes upon your Son. We pray you continue to do that for those suffering today. Be with Herb Dirksy in the gardens and Dolores Droppers and Neil Brugink. And we pray that you would bless them to know your kindness, to be with them by your spirits to the end of the age. Pray you would also be with Wayne Novice. Give him strength, Father, physically and especially spiritually, to know your kindness, to know that you are his God and that he belongs to you. We pray the same for Donna Call Yao. Enable her to recover from uh, sickness and to, as she's back on cancer medication, that it would be effective. And we pray that you would continue to keep her eyes upon you. And Lord, we do pray the same for Don Scruz as well at Pine Haven and that your hand would be upon him to know your goodness and grace and your peace and to be able to rest in having a Savior and King. Father, we pray the same for all of us, and we pray that you would keep our eyes fixed upon the Savior who reigns over all nations as King. And as we think about those who are in the midst of the persecuted church around the world who are suffering in secret today, uh, that you would enable them to know equally that they serve a King who rules and reigns over everything that they're going through. And may they keep their eyes upon him. Be at our session meeting also this week as you would enable us to be wise and thoughtful as we interview Lincoln, and that you would give us clarity on what is best for your namesake and for our church. And Father, we do pray going into the weekend that secret church and going through Ruth and seeing your providence be a blessing as we also consider your word there and pray for the persecuted church. Be with us, Father. Keep our eyes upon your Son. And may we now go out to bless others, having been blessed in the Spirit by him. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let us now stand and receive the Lord's benediction as we go. May the God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, shine in your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.